How's everyone doing? Good? Good. Um, so, again, my name is Zach. If you don't know me, I'm a pastor here at The Grove, and we just finished a six-week uh, series through uh, Ruth, and so um, we were there for six weeks, and um, we're doing a series on repentance, which I know is awesome. Everyone's super excited about, um, and then we'll be in here for three weeks, and then we'll be in Luke for like well over a year. Um, so get ready for that. Buckle up. We're going to be in Luke. It's going to be awesome. Um, and so if you want to get ahead and start reading Luke, I would recommend that. Um, but we're going to talk about repentance uh, for a few weeks. And there, there's a couple reasons I want to explain why I want to talk about repentance. Um, I know the word repent or repentance can have some baggage attached to it in our time today. Um, and, and it's funny that it has that because um, it's been used a lot of the time, specifically where we live in what we can call like the Christ-haunted South. And um, where we live, we can uh, hear the word repent, and it can be used to really scare us into uh, church, into raising our hand, into praying a prayer. And this idea that if we don't repent, um, these horrible things are going to happen to us. And, and, and those things may even be true, and we can talk about that today. But the Bible's super clear in Romans chapter 2 that it's God's kindness and patience that is meant to lead us to repentance. Not his anger. In fact, it's, it's actually him holding his anger back. It's not that his anger doesn't exist, but what's meant to lead us to repentance is God holding his anger back and not letting it flow to us and waiting and hoping and, and working in our lives that we might repent. And so, man, I, I think it's gotten a bad rap because it's been used to do the very thing it's not meant to be used for, to scare people into Christianity, which I don't know if, if that's really a door at all. But we, 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 we've heard that and we've seen that. I've heard it. I've maybe even used it before. I apologize. But here's the thing. Repentance is a beautiful word. Not only is it a beautiful word, um, it shouldn't be like a scary word at all because it should be a part of your everyday vocabulary. It should actually be a daily practice of yours and maybe even uh, several times a day. Repentance isn't this like one thing you do one time. It is something you do once at the beginning of your faith and then it's the ongoing ethic of your life that you will continue to confess and repent, confess and repent, confess and repent, because you're not perfect. You're not Jesus. And so you constantly repent. We'll talk about what, what repentance is a little bit later. Today, I really want to uh, frame the reason uh, around why we should repent, because I can tell you what it is, and then you would know it is, and you might even go out and try and do it this week, and that wouldn't be good, because you need to know why. Why should we repent? Why, why, why should we respond? Everyone knows what the word respond means. It means to do something in, in response, which isn't a good definition because I just used the word in the definition. <laughs> but it means to, uh, to, to do something because of, right? And so um, why is repentance the right response to what God has done for us? And so we read in Exodus chapter 20. Um, and we'll kind of go through this. Um, and, and, and so what God's doing, just kind of set the scene, God's um, called Moses up onto the mountain and he's giving him the law. Now, this is the beginning of the Ten Commandments, but there's um, a lot more law to come. Uh, but this is just the, the, the ten that um, kind of summarize uh, the rest of the law, actually, is what we will see in the New Testament. Um, and so Moses, he's getting the law. This, for those, those people who know the Bible, this is the first time Moses is getting the law. Something happens a little bit later, and it's funny. Uh, we'll talk about it, because it always cracks me up. Um, but Ro uh, Exodus chapter 20 says this about... Uh, is God speaking to Moses. And God spoke all these words, saying, verse 2, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So, so the first thing God, God is speaking the law to his covenant people. These are his people. This is, he, he's doing it to Moses. Moses is going to go relay the law. Um, he's actually going to get some tablets with the law written on it, which is pr sort of pretty cool when God just gives you like a, like, hey, like, I mean, that would be nice to just like, hey, God, what am I supposed to do? And he just like wrote it down on a tablet for you. That would be nice. Um, and this is not like an iPad, like a stone tablet, just so we're clear. Um, and so if you had that, that'd be awesome. But, but this is what God's doing for his people. He's saying, this is how you're to live. And this is good. Sometimes we, we want to pit grace against law. Like, grace is the New Testament. We have this gracious God in the New Testament. He's like all about grace and not the law. The, the law was a means of grace for the, Israel, for the Israelite people. They just came under an, an oppressive um, regime, like an op oppressive country. They were slaves in an oppressive country, and now God's setting up laws so that would never happen again to them. Now, it would because they're not going to follow the laws, but if they would follow the laws, this is setting it up like, hey, hey, I know you've had a hard time. You, you've been my, this isn't the first time you're my people. You've been my people for a while, and some horrible things have happened to you. I'm giving you a gift of grace in the law that this would never happen again if you would just follow these laws. 
if you would use these laws to, to organize your communities and your country and your, and, and your people groups, if you would use this, and then you wouldn't go through the hardships. Not, not because there's some sort of like blessing attached to it, although there, there is, but because it's just working in the way in which God designed the world to work. And this is what we'll see. He says, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. The first thing God says when communicating the law to his people, his, his covenant people, is he reminds them that he's good. That the, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. He reminds them of what he's already done for them. So when he gives, him the, when he gives these laws, they're not going to be afraid or be mistaken that maybe these laws are to rob us of things. Like God's saying, I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I have to do that. Um, man, God's trying to take joy from me. He doesn't want me to have a good life. He wants me to have this regimented discipline. I got like a robot life. And that's, God's reminding at the very beginning, this is not the life I've called you to. I'm a good God who loves you. I'm a good God who has already brought you out of Egypt, who's already brought you out of slavery. And this is God reminding his people of who he is before he goes on to give them the law. The first reason in response, and the main reason in response, and we'll, we'll cover this at length later, that we should respond to the gospel at all and specifically to respond with repentance is because God is good, because God is kind. And so, spoiler alert, what repentance is, to turn from our sin and to turn towards a good, loving, kind God is the best thing that we could do. There's no, like, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't want to turn from that which would destroy you and turn to that which would give you life. And this is God reminding his people that I am a life giver. I have taken you out of slavery. I've taken you out of um, Egypt, and I've brought you out of that. And it, he didn't just, like, do it one day, like, hey, guys, let's get out of Egypt. Let's go. Like, there was, like, miracles, and, like, water turned, like, to blood, and, and there, like, water split down the middle, and they walked on dry land. Like, crazy stuff happened. And so this is a, a huge reminder to remind God. God is a powerful God, but he's a good God. He loves his people. He loves his family. But, in verse 3, he says, you shall have no other gods before me. I'm a good God. You shouldn't want any other gods, but he's making a command here. You shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God and my jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the, of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to the thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. And so when we think about this, God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't, you know, make a, a carved image of any other thing on earth or under the sea, all these things not to do. Most of us are probably like, I don't do that. I don't have like, I don't have any other gods. I don't worship, you know, like Zeus or um, Allah or anything like that. Like, I, most of us probably hear that, read that. We're like, oh, check. I'm good. I don't have other gods. I don't make images of God. Uh, maybe there's a painting of Jesus in my house, but that's the real God, right? So that's okay. We'll talk about that later. Probably not. But um, we'll, it's, we'll talk about that later. But uh, yeah, so there's like this idea that you should have no other gods. I think most American Christians are just like, check, good, I'm good. When the reality is all sin at its root is idol worship. All sin is idol worship. Now, um, we can go to like really external things and we could say that, hey, man, to... to uh, yell and to scream at your spouse, your wife, because she's not doing what you want her to do. You're worshiping your, um, you could be worshiping your spouse, and now because she's not uh, doing the things that God should do, right, loving you, comforting you, affirming you, things that God will do in Christ, but things that your spouse was not created to do, when, when they don't do that, you yell and scream at them, that's idol worship, you're worshiping your spouse. But we could even bring that further, and the reality is you're also worshiping yourself. You are your own greatest idol, that you think you deserve to be served when you come home. You think you deserve to have your kids serve you and love you and to, to play the sports you played in high school so that you, they can be better than you and you can live vicariously through them, right? That's what we do, and so we want that, and we worship ourselves. We can go on and on, whether, you know, whether it's at work, you can, you can worship um, your, your, your job place, your work. You could think, man, like, I really, really want to get that promotion. I want money. Like, you can worship money. You can worship um, trucks and cars and houses, all these things that you worship. But the reality is all those trickle down to you, that I deserve that house. I deserve that promotion. I want that thing. I, I should have it. And it's idol worship. And so, so one of the things that I th I'm really afraid of is this. I don't think that we're ever going to get to a place here at, at the Grove 
where we're going to overemphasize the grace and mercy of God. Mostly because I don't think it can be done. I just straight up don't think it can be done. I think in places where we think it's been done, it hasn't been done at all. Because grace and mercy leads to repentance. So, so where we think, hey, they, they just preach grace and they preach no repentance. Well, they're not really preaching grace at all, right? Because grace wouldn't keep people in their sins. Grace moves people out of their sins. Because if you hear the gospel and you hear it correctly proclaimed, then you want to leave your sins. You want to run towards God because he's worth it. Because he's good. And so, so he, he, here's the thing that I'm afraid of. I'm afraid of for all the grace and mercy we'll preach, what would happen is that we wouldn't over-preach it. We would under-emphasize under repentance and holiness and therefore really never preaching grace at all. That's my fear. Because I love grace, and it's easy to get up here and talk about grace, and be like, man, God loves you, and God, has, God, God wants um, the best for you, and so you should follow him, and, and not really talk about what following him looks like, because there's ways in which uh, we could easily pinpoint that some of us are not following Jesus. And so he, he, here's the reality. That's my fear, is that we could... Um, preach what we would call grace, but never actually be preaching at all because we never attach repentance in our response to that grace in, in the message. And so God says that he's a good God, but you should have no other gods before him. No other gods. No idol worship. And again, idols could be anything, and almost, almost all idols are good things. That's what makes them scary. A spouse is a great thing to have. They're just a really, really crummy God. Really bad. Kids, wonderful. Crummy God. Jobs, great. Everyone should have a job, whether outside the home or inside the home. Everyone should work. Work makes a crummy God. These things are just bad gods. And so idol worship, uh, I think we've either uh, think, hey, I don't have gods, or we think idol worship, hey, I don't really have idols, because I've seen, I've seen uh, um, Indiana Jones, and I don't have like a little golden monkey in my house that I, you know, have on a shelf. Like, that. I don't have idols. But that's not what it means. And so idol worship is anything Anything that you put above God in your uppermost affections, anything you love more than God, anything. And so to quickly pinpoint your idols, here, here, here's what you can do. Think about that one thing that if God took from you, you don't know if you'd be okay. That one thing, whatever it is, whether it's your job, it's your spouse, or your kids. That you just Now, I'm not saying they wouldn't go through a hard time, but that you're like, God, don't. You can, you can have everything in my life, but you can't have this. You can have everything you want, but you can't have this part of my life. Don't touch this. What's the thing that worries you at night? What stops you from sleeping? If it's not God, then that could be an idol. That's an indicator. And so, so to pinpoint your idols and what you might have before God, those are just some easy questions for you. And we should know that God is good and better than those idols. That God is good and he's better than those idols. And so the reason why we should turn from those gods and those idols is because God is good, because he's kind, because he has taken his people out of Egypt, he's taken his people out of slavery, and he's done the same for us in Christ, that we have been slaves to sin, and yet while we were dead, and while we were enslaved, while we were enemies to God, Christ died for us. That's a good, kind God. There's another reason why I would implore you to respond to God's call, not to have other gods, to respond to the gospel. And it's in Ezekiel. It'll be up here on the screen, um, and we can turn there. We'll be in Ezekiel chapter 16, just for a second. Probably one verse, maybe two. Um, but this is another reason why we should have no other gods. This is a fun verse, as you guys can see. We'll be in verses 39 and 40. Um, he says this. He's talking about uh, his people and other countries and uh, gods. He says this, I will give you into their hands and they shall throw down your vaulted chamber and break down your lofty places. They shall strip you of your clothes and take your beautiful jewels and leave you naked and bare. That's fun. That's fun. But this is the reality. The reason why we should repent is because those other gods are not good for us. They will tear down our vaulted places. They will leave us naked and bare. They will steal all that God has given us and the good gifts that God has given us. Those other gods will rob us from those things. And God will give us over to those other gods if we keep chasing after them, if we keep running after them. Why would God, why would a kind God do that? Because it's kind and good 
for God to teach us that those things will do just that. And those things will end in destruction. And so if we can taste some of that destruction here on earth, it's so much better than tasting that destruction in eternity. And so, so God gives us over to those things, those passions, those lusts, those, those other gods that we may taste and see that they're not good and then run to God and taste and see that he is. And this is a good God. And so the reason we should respond to the gospel is because those things will destroy us and he will not. It's really, it really is just good news. It, it is. It's, it's, it's incredible news that, that God has. Um, because here, here's the reality of the things that we don't like in America is that we deserve punishment. We deserve punishment for our sins. And we know this because he, he, here's the story of God, right? God, God created everything that is. He created everything up there and everything down here. And then he created Adam. He said, Adam, you're going to be my representative to all the stuff I created. You're going to um, represent me. You're going to be my image bearer, right? An image bearer um, doesn't mean we were just uh, created in the likeness of God in the sense that we're like him, although I think there are some ways that we are. But image bearer means this idea that when God, when, pe- when, the, when the things of this earth see us, they see that we represent someone bigger than us. We bear an image, something bigger than us, right? So like a money bears the image of the rulers of this country, we should bear the image of the ruler of this world. Not the bad one, but King Jesus. So we should bear the image. And so wherever, it's like statues in, in other countries. They, they put statues up um, of, of rulers and then people tear them down. It's happening right here. But statues, would, would, as soon as someone would take over a country, they would put up a statue of the emperor uh, or the ruler or the king. And so, like, could, so if someone came into the square, they'd see, oh, this place belongs to that king. We're to be that in this world. When people walk around and they see us, they, oh, this, this, this world belongs to Christ because look at these people. We're his image bears. And so he created Adam and, and then he saw it wasn't good for Adam to be alone and so he, created all, he, he brought all the animals to Adam. Adam got to name the animals one by one trying to find a helpmate for him. And none of them were good enough. So God said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to put you to sleep. We're going to take a rib out. We're going to create Eve. And then, and then you guys, and he wakes up and he's super excited. He sees this woman for the first time and he literally just like belts out mine. Um, it, it's, it's what he says in the, in the Hebrew to his mind. Like, this is mine. And he's so excited. And, 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 they, and they're, they're married, the first wedding, Genesis um, there. And, and, and it's just amazing. But it doesn't last very long. A serpent comes in and deceives Eve and Adam. And Adam's not there to help his wife. He's just passively sitting by, watching it all happen. And sin enters the world and fractures um, everything. And now, now we have all play an active role in rebelling against the ruler of the universe. We play an active role. And in, in, even in our, you know, enlightened Western society, what's the punishment for treason? It's death. Like, even Western societies agree that treason is death. And we've committed the most high treason there is, rebelling against a good, right king of the universe. And so we know and we can feel in our hearts that punishment is right. Even we might say and, and be convinced that it's not for times, we know that it's not our culture knows that punishment is, is right. And, and here's the incredible thing. Adam and Eve were banished from the garden. And they, didn't, they, didn't, they couldn't have right fellowship with, with God any longer. And, the, and then Christ comes, lives the life that Adam should have lived, died the death that Adam should have died, and has now provided a way for us to come back into the garden. And not even the garden, but something better than the garden. God's kingdom. And so we get this invitation to come in, and, and, and that's the good news that Christ died for us to free us from our sins, to free us from slavery of these things that would destroy us. And so we, we turn from those things, and we turn towards God. Because if we don't, those things will destroy us. And God, in his kindness, will even give us over to those things to teach us and show us that those things will destroy us. The other reason we see in Exodus chapter 20 is that God's a jealous God. God's a jealous God. And that may, like, be weird for us to understand because jealousy is like this thing. I mean, if you flip to uh, Galatians chapter 5, I think verse 20, you would even see that jealousy is not a fruit of the Spirit. It's not. It's fruit of the flesh. But this is a different kind of jealousy. This isn't like me getting mad that Margie's talking to someone but it, it's, it's me getting upset that someone's trying to take Margie away from me. It's 
See the difference? Like, I'm not just mad. Like, Mar- if Margie's, like, talking to some guy, I'm not going to go over there and, like, punch him in the face, right? I may want to, but I know that's wrong, so I'm not going to do that. But if someone's, like, bringing her flowers and, like, writing her cards and texting her late at night, like, like there, that's a diff- there can be a different emotion. Like, hey, no, no. Like Adam said about Eve, like, no, she's, she's mine. It's not this possessive thing. It's just that she, we've decided that we're each other's. And you don't get to do this, bro. Like, you don't, that's not, we don't get to have that, you don't get to have that kind of relationship with my wife. And so God being jealous, saying that there, you shall have no other gods before me, says, hey, look, you don't get to have other gods. You're, you're mine. You don't get to worship these other things. You're, you're mine. And I'm yours. You shouldn't even want these other things. You have all that you want in me. But he, and so they get this law, and they hear that God is good, that God wants no other gods to be worshipped, and that he's jealous, and they shouldn't carve any image of him or anything else. Moses goes, you is the rest of the story, Moses goes on, gets some more law. While he's getting this law, God's literally like, don't have, you don't have any images of me. The Israelites, what are they down there doing? They're like melting all their gold, making this golden calf which is like this craziest God to worship in the world. Why not like a lion or like a bear or something cool like that? But a little, have you seen calves try to walk? It's embarrassing. Like, I'm just like, why would you want to worship that? And, and honestly, if you, if you read it closely, they're not worshiping a different God. They're, they're thinking God's like this, that their God, Yahweh, is like this little baby calf just falling over. And so, like, Moses comes down the mountain with the tablets he sees the golden calf, and he's just like, oh, man, gosh, darn it, God. And he throws the, he throws the, the, the tablets down in anger. He's like, oh, i got to go back up top to the mountain again. You know, he goes up there, and God's not super happy about that. Uh, but, but this is the story that even while they're getting this law, this grace of, of, of don't have other gods, they're going to destroy you. They're down there doing the exact thing, same thing. God's trying. Why? Because in God's kindness, he's allowing them to worship this golden calf. So they can immediately see what's going to happen when they do. And so they would be less, hopefully less tempted to continue to do so in the future. But the story of Israel isn't that simple. It doesn't end there. They will continue to worship other gods. They will continue to um, marry people from other religions and, and to, to begin to worship their gods. And, and, and God will continue to keep his promise that he will let them be taken um, so that they will learn that he is their God that he's good, they don't need any other gods. And this is our story. We, all of us, have worshipped other gods. Whether it's our self and our pride, or out here, whether it's our, our kids or our spouses or our future spouse, we don't know who they are, but we're worshipping them. We'd, we'd love um, to, to have one. and like, Whatever it is that you're worshipping, that job, that new promotion, that, new, that, that bigger paycheck, whatever it is, you're worshipping this other god, and God's saying, don't do that. You don't need that promotion. You don't need a spouse. A spouse would be awesome to have, but you don't need one. You don't need kids. You don't need that, that bigger porch, that, that um, taller truck. You don't need that new rifle or whatever. You don't need those things. What you need is me. God's saying that to all of us. And, and so the gospel is that God gave us what we needed, not what we wanted. God gave us Christ. And that no matter who we are or what, like, because here's my guess. My guess is no one here has melted gold and made a calf and worshipped it, right? Like, that's just my guess. If you're, hey, if that's you, I'm sorry I'm embarrassing you right now, uh, but you should stop that right away. Like, it's not good. But my guess is no one has actually built a statue and worshipped it. And all of us would probably agree, even if you're not a Christian here, but you're just visiting, you're like, that's probably not a good thing to do, just like start melting stuff down and worshipping it like it's some sort of God. You've never done that. Um... The Bible's filled with them doing things just like that. Uh, men of God murdering other people to cover up affairs. The Bible's filled with, we went over this last week, right? Just prostitutes and uh, murderers and evil people. And yet, God extends forgiveness and grace and mercy to those who what? Believe and repent. This is why that repentance is so necessary, because it's part of our salvation, Siri doesn't understand, <laughs> which makes sense because she doesn't have a soul, I don't think. So that was fun. Um, God was doing uh, <laughs> repentance. We should do it. We should just do it. Um, 
it's, it's part of our salvation, right? And so, so our salvation experience, God's, God gives us grace. He gives us faith. He asks for that faith back, and, and we, we put our faith in him, and we repent. Repentance is a gift from God. Faith is a gift from God. Everything necessary for salvation comes from God. God grants his people faith and repentance. Um, but, but in some sort of mystery, uh, it's still a choice. I don't understand it, but God grants his people repentance, and then we choose to repent. I don't get it, but we do it. And so, so here's the call for us in Christ, is to put our faith in him and to repent, to turn from our sins and to turn towards him. And it doesn't stop the day you become saved. It will continue on, because my guess is here, there are a lot of people who at some point in this room repented in the past, and there's things today that we need to repent of. And there will be things tomorrow and the next week. And I want to end with this. I know it's probably short. It was short. I want to end with this. I want to make repentance a normative thing here at the Grove. Because I feel like we think of repentance as like this big ordeal that like, oh man, I have to repent. Like that sounds scary and like this big thing. I feel like I already did that once. I got to do it again. But no, like repentance is this normative thing where if there's anything in your life that is that you're worshiping more than Christ, you should repent and turn from that and turn towards Christ. And we'll talk about exactly what that means next week and how to do it the week after. But this is the call. And so, so, so is, is repent, and I, want, I don't want you to be scared of that word. We use it a lot. We're going to continue to use it a lot. I don't want to be mistaken as some angry preacher who, who's calling everyone to repent. You've got to repent, get right or get left. You know, like all these things. But it's God's kindness that comes in and calls us and draws us to repentance. So the question then is for us today, what is uppermost in your affections? What do you love most? Like in your life, what's that thing that you could not live without that if God took from you, there's no way you'd ever be okay? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it what? Is it a job? Is it, is it, I mean, could it be that TV time? Is that what it is? Like, I just, I gotta come home and watch TV. I gotta come home and have a glass of wine. Like I just, if I don't get my glass of wine, I'm not okay. If God took wine from me, there's no way I'd be okay. What is it in your life? that is so uppermost in your affections you would not be okay if it was gone. And whatever that is, repent of it before it destroys you. Repent of it before a good, loving, jealous God allows it to crumble underneath you and for you to fall that you might get back up and worship him alone. This is today's call. It's, it's not necessarily how to do it or, or what it looks like, but I just want you to really think about and pray through what is it in my life that I love most? If it's God, amen, tell me how to do that. I would love to that, but it'd be always uppermost in my affections. But if it's anything but God, like I imagine it is for most of us, let's, let's ask God to help us with that. Let's ask God for repentance. Because it is a gift. Let's ask God for repentance. God, give me repentance over this thing. I don't want this thing to be the most important thing in my life. Now, he's given us some really cool graces right now, right? Because like sports is a huge one I normally talk about right here. But we don't get to do that right now, and the ones that are doing it aren't doing it very well. You watch the NBA, it's really sad. And so we don't get to have that right now. So I don't even have to like, press into the guys and be like, y'all rushing out of here Sunday, Sundays as soon as you know, church ends to go get your TV set up. Like, let's repent. I don't have to do that right now. But maybe next year, I, hopefully I'll get to say that because um, we'll have some sort of normalcy and I'll have to press into sports again. Um, but whatever it is, God is better and he's worth it. I'm going to pray for us here in a second, and we're going to respond to the gospel. The good news that Christ has even allowed us to repent and come to him. And so uh, on both sides of the stage, one of the ways we respond is through communion. And so over here we have a communion station, over here we have a communion station. And so uh, if you're a Christian with us today, I'm so glad that you're here. Come up and have communion. Come up and be reminded that Christ's body was broken for you and his blood was spilt, that you may be healed, that you may be freed from slavery, that you may have him as your one and only God. Come up. Uh, it's double stacked cups. We're trying to do things a little, like we don't want to touch every single thing. So um, the, the bottom cup has uh, gluten-free bread in it. So for you gluten-free folks, you're welcome. Uh, the top cup has uh, wine or juice, depending on your preference. They're at both stations. You just grab a whole stack. Um, you can pick it up. Say a prayer of thanksgiving. 
take the bread, take the wine, and there's trash cans next to them uh, for you to dispose of those cups. So whenever you're ready, as we're singing, you can come up and do that. If you're not a Christian here today, I am so glad that you're here. I don't know why you're here. Maybe God's calling you. I would love for that to be the case, Um, but I don't know why you're here. I'm so glad you're here. You're welcome to do everything else we do. This would be the one thing we'd ask for you not to do. It's not because we, we don't like you or we, we, no one's going to judge you if you don't do it. Um, but the reality is it wouldn't make sense to come and partake of the body and blood of Christ if you haven't decided that's what you want to do. And so this would be for the Christians. And so, hey, but, but if you're here and you, and you have not repented ever and you want to and want to come to the table and partake in the elements, I'd, I'd love for you to come talk to me. I'm going to be off over here to the side. Uh, I would love to talk to you about what repentance and faith looks like and how uh, we could pray for that together. Uh, we're going to sing as well. Members of the Grove, if you want to continue to support us uh, financially, there's giving in, in the back, um, and, and you can give on your way out, or you can give as part of your, your time of worship. Um, you can also give online. Uh, p- vis- uh, guests with us, I'm not asking you to give. These are for our members and um, our regular attenders who want to support us. Uh, we, we see giving as an act of worship, so we do it during our worship time. Uh, where we're all singing and resp- we, we see giving as a response uh, as part of worship. And so we do it as our response time that God has given us so much that we give a portion of what he's given uh, back to him to be used for the advancement of his kingdom um, in his church. And so uh, that's in the back. You can do that online, but that's how we respond. We'll sing and pray. And I want to add this one last thing that we've done a few times. Hey, if you're here today and you just feel like um, there's something in your life you need to repent of and you want to go talk to someone, just go do it. Uh, I, I want to give everyone permission to interrupt someone else's worship time to repent and to respond and, and to ask for prayer, to ask for help. Um, so even if someone's got their hand up and they look like they're really going after it, just tap them, hey, can I talk to you? Just, just, just if that's something that you feel led to do because there's something in your life that kind of has stirred your affections more than Christ and you want to repent, like, let's, just, let's just repent today. You don't have to wait till I explain how and, 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 uh, or what and how. Like You can just get after it today, and, and God and the, and the Holy Spirit will show up, and he'll, he'll lead you. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll respond. Father God, I thank you so much for this morning. Um, I thank you for all the graces that you've given us, um, whether it's just seeing um, your people gathered back together as one church, whether it's um, just, just hearing uh, your saints sing loudly as in one voice, Um, hearing your word proclaimed and read out loud, Lord, I just thank you for all the graces you've given us. Uh, I pray, Lord, for those here today, uh, for for those of us who have um, raised certain things in our life above where they ought to be, and we have disordered desires, and we desire things in our lives more than we desire you, Lord, that you would just cause us to repent this morning, that you would cause us to repent, that you would cause us um, to run from those things and to run towards you. God, grant us those gifts of repentance this morning. Lord, if there's people in here who just need to talk or need to pray with someone, Lord, I pray that you would do that, that you would stir in their hearts and you would push them as an act of faith to go find someone um, and to go talk to them and to ask for prayer and ask for help. I pray that there would be confession, forgiveness, and repentance, Lord. And 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we do that, if we confess our sins, then you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And Lord, and so as we confess and repent this morning, I pray that we would feel the forgiveness that's already true of us. As we confess our sins to one another, Lord, I pray that we'd feel the forgiveness in love in tangible ways uh, that you have for us through your people. Father, I love you. I pray this all in your son Jesus' name. Amen.